Hi guys, my name is Sean. I'm a houseplant enthusiast from Jakarta, Indonesia. I like to nerd out to the science behind how we can keep our houseplants happy and to multiply them in our homes. So if you're into that kind of content, do subscribe to my channel and send me likes. So today I will share with you everything I know about soil, um, what they're made of, how we can mix them, and how you can mix your own depending on your environment and as well as the plant species that you're caring for. I actually started this plant journey not very long ago, uh, 10 months to be exact, and I've learned so much over this course of time. Um, I, I learned a lot from Googling, uh, from YouTubers, as well as podcasts. So shout out to Plant Daddy Podcast, Bloom and Grow Radio, and uh, uh, On the Ledge with Jane Perrone. Thank you guys so much for this information, and, and, and now I'm sharing this with my audience, and hopefully you guys can pass along this knowledge, because it is truly fascinating and it is fun to, to play with soil. So to digress a little bit, in my hand here, I have the Begonia Maculata. I got this as a tiny plant, but it kept growing and I've taken cuttings and, and stuck it right back into the soil and it's grown so much and it's now flowering. So I, I'm very, very happy with this guy. Highly recommend for you to get one of these. They're actually very easy to care for, but they do rot uh, if you overwater it and they don't want to be dried out for too long. Uh, and they do well both indoors and outdoors. Okay, so back to our topic. Uh, plants actually evolved over millions of years to get to where they are today. And that means that they are used to the growing medium that they have evolved in. For example, you have uh, swampy, uh, soggy wetlands, and then you have your rainforest. Um, rainforest also covers a lot of different uh, varieties of growing conditions. You could have your rainforest floor and you could have um, way up top on the canopy. You also have your caves, uh, plants that grow on rock surfaces, on cliff sides. It's quite fascinating where they are. They grow under the, in the, in the sea, underwater, um, and in the desert, of course, you have your cactus and succulents. So they've adapted to live there. And many growers actually can grow them in any soil, like the standard potting soil that you tend to buy them in, uh, depending on the region that you're in. Uh, they, the plants have been grown there and they have adapted to the nursery conditions. For example, like a cactus that has grown in a, a regular potting soil have adapted to live there, but you just have to water very, very uh, infrequently. Uh, however, if you put that same cactus in the, the uh, like a sandy type, very rocky type mix, you can actually water it a little bit more and it will like that. So here's the, here's the three keywords for you. So plants have evolved. Uh, over time to get to where they are now, to have that physical properties, which means some of them have gripping roots, some of them have, uh, they like a little bit more wet, uh, soggy or wet soil. And number two is that plants um, can adapt. So they have adapted to the, the soil that they were grown in or propagated in or whatever the nursery had them in. So they uh, have adapted there. But the third one is to thrive. So in order to thrive, the, the plant actually do need a little bit of um, adjustment. That means that you will have to probably create, whether it's a moss pole or your own aeroid mix, you have to give them a little bit of that extra um, care and attention for them to thrive. So again, the three words are uh, evolution, adaptation, and to thrive. Thriving. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, so keep that in mind. Uh, and in this video, I'll, I'll mostly cover the third part, which is uh, to have them thrive. Because whatever uh, pot or media that the plant came in when you bought it, it's gonna be okay there. It's gonna be happy, but it's not gonna be amazing. And just having that extra knowledge on soil and soil mixes is just gonna make the, the plant game so much more fun and interesting for you. So I'm gonna take you back to the classroom and show you a planty diagram. Uh, it's gonna be a bit repetitive to my uh, diagram on the watering video. Uh, so if you've seen that, go right ahead and, and skip this part. But it's important to know like why aeration is important in the roots and why we shouldn't overwater them. So we want to have an uh, airy mix where it's possible. So I'll be right back. So here is a drawing of a plant. And I want to remind you what happens uh, when the plant is growing, which is that uh, sunlight reacts with carbon dioxide and water within the leaves uh, in a chlorophyll to in a process called photosynthesis and that produces sugar and sugar is actually the, the physical being of the plant so when your plant is producing sugar it's, it's, it's creating a bigger mass for itself and this is what we want for our plants and 
we need to discuss here the, the function of the roots because that's important when we talk about soil. So the number one function of the root would be to anchor the plant, to make sure that it stays in place, that it doesn't get knocked over uh, by any means, whether it's environmental factor or if it's just an animal walking, walking all over it um, or kicking it aside. <laughs> Uh, next up, you have the uh, moisture and nutrient that is absorbed by the roots up into the stem and to the leaves. So the plant needs to efficiently take in uh, moisture and nutrient from the soil. And this is why it's important for our soil to be able to absorb and release the moisture appropriately. Some soil could be way too fast uh, drying and some soil can be way too soggy. And the third that is important here would be that, that uh, the roots actually need to breathe oxygen. This is something that not a lot of us know, but while the leaves are breathing in carbon dioxide in this uh, process called photosynthesis, the roots are, need oxygen. So if you keep dumping water on it, or if you have soil that is just con constantly wet, you are essentially drowning the roots. So roots actually take in uh, water or moisture through a process called osmosis. So roots don't really have a mouth or, or any parts that it can move to, to let it be able to absorb, to eat water whenever it wants to. Um, osmosis is a process in which uh, water is going to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Uh, it's just a physical property of water and the plant is just taking advantage of that property. So the roots are adapted so that it's a low concentration. So any water or moisture that's in the soil is always going to be taken up by the roots, up the stem into the leaf. The roots can't say, oh, I'm done, I'm full, I have enough water. And then they would stop the osmosis. They can't. They can't stop the process. So if you have water in there, it will continually just keep pushing the water up uh, towards the leaves. And uh, when water is uh, transported up to the leaves, actually, uh, the water is used up by the chlorophyll uh, in, this, uh, in phot photosynthesis and any excess water would be uh, removed through a process called transpiration and gutation. Uh, you don't need to know the details but it's basically how uh, water is lost through the leaves by droplets or uh, as water vapor. That's just a natural way for them to get rid of excess water. What happens when you overwater is that there's way too much water than, than it can handle. So it is very stressed out and it will, some of the leaves are going to turn yellow and die off. So some, some of the classic signs of overwatering is a lot of yellow leaves that are dying off. If it's way, way overwatered, uh, the roots, stems or leaves will rot and turn into mush. And this is very easy to see visually and we don't want that to happen. Um, so to summarize, soil actually need to dry out between watering. Uh, usually, uh, except when you're talking about some moisture-loving plants that are maybe grown in very wet conditions such as ferns. Uh, they're very thirsty so they constantly need water. Although I must say that they do appreciate being dried out a little bit in between watering. It's just they don't tolerate that long period of dryness. And next is that you should have good airflow to the roots. So you need to make sure that air is uh, moving about in there, whether you're using a terracotta pot or whether you have uh, sort of an airy mix, or whether you add soil amendments uh, such as perlite and vermiculite and other types that will allow air into uh, the plant, into the, into the soil. So one last thing I want to talk about is uh, bacteria and fungus. So when you have a soil that is uh, retaining a lot of moisture, the bacteria and fungus is going to throw a party in there and it's going to invite pests to come to and these will decimate your plant. They will eat the, they will destroy the roots and, and eat your plant. And you don't want that to happen. So this is why when you have a fast draining soil or soil that dries out in between watering, it's less likely for bacteria and fungus to grow uh, in the soil. So I'm gonna go through with you about 20 plus ingredients that is available in my area that I use as a mixture in my soil mixes. Um, you may not have some of these available in your area, but you can always substitute um, one another. It's, there's no hard rule as to... Jia! Cut it out! So I'm going to go through with you about 20-something of the ingredients that I have um, that is available in my region. 
uh, do not panic if you don't have that. It, there's no formula in nature. Like there's no, you can't say like, oh, you need like one part of this and two part. No. So everything is just eyeballing and you can easily substitute one media for another. So here are three Peperome Incanas and this is a very good example. Uh, this one um, parent plant is living in terracotta pot and a very, very fast draining soil. So he's not as prone to overwatering. And this one is the cutting and I put him in a plastic pot with um, very slow draining soil. It's cocoa peat uh, mix. And this means that I will water him way less, probably three times less than the parent plant. And this one's also a cutting and it's grown in a terracotta pot, but uh, a slow release uh, moisture uh, soil mix. So uh, this one is very, very fast draining. This is probably second fast draining and this is gonna be super slow. So I'm going to water these very differently, but they will all be happy regardless of which pot and soil combination I give them as long as I'm watering them correctly and not overwatering them. The most important thing for you in this video is to understand the theory and you know apply that in, in your living condition, in your planet, in whatever soil medium is available in your area. Again, you just want to basically adjust your watering frequency based on um, the, the pot type and the soil that you have and as well as the sunlight. So that's the most important thing. Uh, so there is a lot of different soil for the same plant. You can actually put them in different soil conditions and they will actually do well. So I'm going to go from the wettest medium to the driest. Uh, starting the first with the first one, obviously it's water. So plants can live in water. As you can see this is a Maranta Lucronoria and it's got roots coming out of it. So a lot of your pothos can also live in water for a very long time, even though I'm not sure if they should live there permanently, but they can live for a long time and can grow and thrive. So I guess next we have the peat moss. And I guess this is what a lot of the nurseries have uh, plants grown in. And this is also what is commonly known as houseplant soil, especially in the US market. However, uh, peat moss is not well, there's a question uh, whether it's sustainable or not. I personally don't think they are because they're taken from the bogs in Canada or elsewhere in the world, uh, swampy lands, where the, the soil is actually organic and uh, rich in nutrient and it's got really good absorbance. It's basically, I mean, it's what people think of as, as common soil. However, when you take uh, soil from the environment put and to put that in your living space and when you're done with them, you just kind of throw them in the garbage. You, you just know that it's not really that sustainable because um, yeah, some of the soil is taken from their natural habitat with, along with this organic material. So this is a very high quality potting uh, type, but I don't personally use this, but to each of its own, right? So next we have um, what we call cocoa peat. So this is a little bit replicating uh, what we discussed before, the peat moss. It's a, also a very PD type uh, soil. Uh, this is actually made from ground up, up coconut husk. And as you can t see, um, it also absorbs uh, water and retains water pretty much similarly to the peat moss. However, it contains zero uh, nutri nutritional value and organic material as it's just made of ground coconut husk. However, uh, I use this almost extensively in everything because it's highly sustainable uh, and it also helps create an industry where people use uh, waste product from coconuts. Uh, and coconuts are used in so many things, right? Uh, we use the fats from the coconut and we, we drink the water from it. So this is a very good way to use their uh, waste and I highly, highly recommend it. Here we have worm casting and this is actually worm poop. So it's uh, organic compost that is quite stable. It's actually quite clean and it smells uh, like soil. It doesn't smell disgusting or anything and I don't mind it. So this is my fertilizer that I go to. I always mix some of these into my soil mix just to give it some organic material, especially when I'm working with uh, cocoa peat where it, and perlite where it has zero nutrient value or close to zero. I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, I'd like to add these guys in there. Sometimes I also add them on the top of the soil as fertilizer. Yeah. Here's a beautiful coleus that uh, I got as a gift and I wanted to show you... Ooh, that's not good, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Get out of the way. Uh, here we have um, it growing in rice hulls and that's very common here in Indonesia. And rice hulls are used widely in nurseries because one, they're sustainable, they're very, very inexpensive. They're just basically leftover um, from the rice that we eat, so just the, the covering of the individual rice. It has very little nutritional value and personally for me, I find that they uh, retain water too much in there. Like you can see, it's very wet in there. But the surface would dry out way too fast. So 
so it so it's gonna have a very quick drying surface and a very soggy bo bottom that's what I noticed but I might be wrong that's why I avoid this at all costs even though I do like the fact that it is very sustainable and it's very good source um, that we're helping out the industry to recycle something that uh, would have otherwise been thrown away so the next medium is this uh, we call it andam here. It's basically twigs, as you can see. So it does retain a bit of moisture and it contains a lot of organic material. But at the same time, you can see that it allows a lot of air movement uh, within the soil. So this is pretty good for your jungle floor type uh, plants like calatheas. So here we have some sphagnum moss. And I'm bringing you here to the sink because I want to show you that they do absorb water very uh, easily and they release them fairly quickly because there's a lot of air that actually moves around in there. So this is actually very good for propagations or for plants that are very prone to rot. And here we have some coconut husks and they actually, they're again, they're coconut. So they are bigger than the uh, coconut chips. And uh, so if you ground this up, you'll get your cocoa peat basically. And this is very good for your Hoyas and Dishkidias and maybe other epi epiphytes. So what happens in a lot of the Thai nurseries is that they would take a cutting and then they would um, kind of stick the cutting right in the middle of it and just jam this in and hang on, let me get you a pot. And they'll just jam this into a pot really tight or they'll, they'll wrap a rubber band around, um, they'll wrap a rubber band around this really tight and then and just propagate it. So that cutting will just root into a beautiful plant and they will love this condition because um, it dry. It, well, you have to soak it in though, however, that's how you water because it doesn't really allow water to get in there in the middle. Um, this is the, uh, the, uh, the roots will actually grow into, the, into these um, grooves in the wood, which is really interesting. And it'll be impossible to get the roots out later. But they love this kind of uh, quality in a, in a medium, uh, Dishkidias and Hoyas, because that's how they grow in nature. So the next one is this coconut chip. And it's actually the same thing. It's coconut husk that is uh, cut into cubes. So as you can see, this actually allows a lot of air into the soil and it allows water to just go right through um, the, the soil media. Uh, this is very good for your arid mixes and for your Hoyas because they, this resembles that, that kind of tree bark uh, or that, that sort of environment that they are used to live in. And uh, epiphytic, sorry, that's what I was going to say, epiphytic uh, characteristics. So over here we have cocoa coir, coconut uh, coir. So that's just shredded coconut. And uh, I do use this sometimes, once in a while, especially on my Dishkidias, uh, uh, as they don't want to have any moisture uh, re retained in them at all. This will also make a, a good uh, topsoil to, to decorate your plants. Uh, so you imagine you have a pot and you put this on the... Let's take this example. So you have the pot and then you have this on the top. So it just looks a little bit... Uh, this is too much, but yeah, you would get my point. Uh, it's just a decorative element to, to that. But yeah, I do use this as medium sometimes. Ooh, and also, this is also very good for the bottom of the pot. Let me show you. I'll shred a little bit off. And then when you have uh, an empty pot here, I can just stick a little bit down there. So this will prevent, uh, and I'll put my soil and, every, and the plant on it. So this prevents the water fr from the soil from, from seeping through the bottom when you water it. So it's like a net, kind of. So the next media would be your moss pole and they come in a various uh, shapes and sizes and they're made of different materials. Some of them are made of coconut uh, coir, some of them are actually made of real moss. Uh, they also come in different lengths and heights. So this will resemble um, like a tree where a, a plant can climb up the tree and usually this helps them grow bigger leaves um, because it fools them into thinking they're growing taller and taller into the canopy. You do need to mist your uh, moss pole once in a while because this will encourage the aerial root to find it and grip it because the aerial roots are drawn to moisture. And sometimes you do have to train your plant in the beginning. You have to tie it to the moss pole and kind of have the aerial root touch the moss pole so that uh, it will attach itself to it. And here you have your pine bark or it's commonly known as orchid bark. So it's usually made of uh, the uh, bark of pine tree as you can tell from the name uh, some of them are actually bigger and chunkier this is actually the finely ground ones and i like to use this as amendments into my aeroid mixes and my hoya mix however this is a little bit expensive so i only use them for my expensive plants and over here we have some dried bamboo 
And this is very airy. It um, doesn't retain much moisture at all. It allows water to go right through. And as you can see, it's a little bit of organic material too. As this breaks down, it will give a little bit of nutrients to the to the plants. And this is also good for your understory jungle, uh, rainforest understory plants like your calatheas. And over here, we have uh, one of my favorite mediums that I use, uh, soil amendments. It's the burnt rice hulls. It's actually uh, rice hulls that are burned and charred. So it's full of carbonized material. And the carbonized material is actually good to prevent root rot. At the same time, it's also rich in nutrients. So it's high in uh, phosphorus and potassium and other micronutrients. So I really like to use that. Also, it doesn't retain water at all. As you can see, this is actually very light and airy. So it allows water to drain right through. This is going to be very good for your cactus succulents uh, as an amendment. But I do use this almost in all my uh, soil mixes. Over here, we have your pumice. And it's a volcanic rock that uh, actually absorbs water but releases it very quickly. So it's good for soil amendments. I know that a lot of the people in Europe actually they just use this as the main soil. So I don't really know how that works. But uh, yeah, here's the footage for you of that. I don't really use this much at all. It's very pricey here. All right, so next, the, this is a vermiculite and it's a very good soil amend amendment. It usually comes hand in hand with perlite. People talk about it, but perlite is completely different from it. So I, I do know that this retains a little bit more moisture than perlite and it's very sparkly. I don't know if the camera can pick it up. It's beautiful. I like to put that uh, sp extra sparkle in some of my soil mixes. And they uh, don't have a lot of nutrients in it. So it's literally just to give it some air aeration in the soil. So over here is the most popular soil amendments out there. It's the perlite. So it's made of puffed volcanic rock and it's mostly air. So it does not retain any moisture at all. However, it does uh, help you wick up a little bit of moisture because uh, there's a lot of pores in here that allows uh, moisture to travel through it very, very quickly. And this is a very popular soil amendment because one, it is uh, inexpensive, it's cheap, and also it's very, very light. Uh, the, the problem with this is that it's very crunchy. So like if you step on it, you've got this powder all over your floor. And at the same time, if you uh, water it too hard, water your plant too hard, the perlite is going to rise up to the top above all the other soils because they're very light and fluffy. So that's just annoying to have around sometimes. But I do use perlite heavily because I find them to be very useful in adding aeration to your soil. All right, so next we have the Akadama, and this is used uh, most commonly as a bonsai soil medium. However, I do use this as my cactus and succulents medium. I like to mix this with perlite and other as well as um, in there so uh, just, just because it's very decorative in its appearance and it also doesn't retain moisture for too long so it's good for fast draining so here is uh, LECA uh, it stands for lightweight expanded clay aggregate and uh, a lot of you have uh, asked for some LECA uh, videos but here's a um, sort of an example of a LECA so it's basically expanded clay that is very airy but it allows water to be wicked up evenly uh, to the top of the soil. So when you have a plant in there, uh, the plant is getting only the uh, amount of moisture it needs, so it doesn't really get overwatered. And another another benefit of using lacquer ball is that you can use sort of a chemical fertilizer, it's, uh, since it's semi-hydroponic. This means that you don't have a lot of organic material around the soil, and this prevents pests from being in there. Though I'm not sure if uh, like growing plants in lacquer prevents pests entirely, I'm not sure. I'm, but theoretically, yeah, pests don't like to live in this kind of conditions. So, yeah. And then you don't have to water the plant as often because all you need to do is make sure that there's a little bit of water down below and the water will be wicked up. And it's very easy for, um, for some plant parents that don't want a lot of fuss with watering. So next here we have the charcoal. And this is used mostly for orchids. Although some aeroid uh, people do use this in their mix as well. This will encourage uh, uh, less root rot because there's a, a lot of carbonized material but at the same time it'll uh, encourage the roots to grow strong and thick so the roots can really grip onto this uh, soil and aeroids do love to grip onto something this allows them to flourish and get bigger leaves and grow taller and faster so the driest media that i can think of is air so here are my tillandsias or air plants and here's uh, what it looks like under the hood so they don't require any medium to grow in and yeah so they take in uh, moisture and nutrient from the air so I guess this covers all of my available growing medium okay so in my hand is a philodendron linnet 
I adore this guy in case you haven't seen my other videos before. They're very easy to care for, but <laughs> I digress. Um, so next I'm going to go through with you some of the common soil mixes that I use and show you how I mix them. There is no ratio that I use. I use whatever I have on hand. I use my hands to eyeball it. And um, I kind of break it down into like maybe four different uh, categories. One would be your, your heavier PD mix that re really retains uh, moisture a lot longer. And the next one you probably have your Calathea uh, type mix where it's a, it's a little bit airy but they don't want to dry out too fast. And then next I would have probably the Aeroid mix which is very airy, Aeroid or Hoya mix which is very airy full of bark or coconut um, chips. And finally, I will show you a little bit about Lekka because Lekka um, or Semi-Hydro is something that a lot of you have requested. So I may do a separate episode on that on its own, but I will <laughs> cover some of the basic here. Alright, so the first mix is one that I use very commonly and it's also what nurseries probably use most often. So you can use a peat and you can either use the uh, peat moss or in my case I use the cocoa peat because it's again I mentioned that it's more sustainable. Uh, so this will retain a, a bit of the moisture, but it's devoid of no nutrients. So this will be my base. I'll use more. Of it. I don't uh, have a recipe. I just eyeball everything. So uh, in nature, plants don't live off of a recipe either. They just grow in whatever medium that they're given in. So yeah, and this is some perlite to give it aeration. And then next I'm gonna do use my favorite medium which is the burnt rice hulls. In Indonesia we call this sakam bakar. This will uh, pre give it aeration and give it some nutrients, uh, phosphorus and potassium as well as give it some, uh, as well as prevent root rot. I'm gonna start mixing that. And as I mix it, this is why I like to mix my own soil. I like to pretend I am the roots. Put my hand in there and just like feel, feel it like how um, like the consistency and feel it to see how it can absorb and release the moisture uh, and then next thing since this is uh, not really uh, this does not contain any nutrients I'm gonna add some uh, worm casting I'm gonna add a little bit more you want to be careful if you are propagating a plant you don't want to add work, worm casting at this stage you just want to keep it very devoid of nutrient because uh, you don't want to rot out the cuttings so you only want to uh, use worm casting for established plants. Okay, so there you go. I actually need a little bit more of that burnt rice hulls, doesn't it? And maybe it looks like it needs a little bit more perlite. So there's a mixture of uh, different elements in this mix that I use and I use this for almost anything can basically survive in this whether you're a fern or if you're a philodendron, an aeroid, you can live in this. If you want to add some sparkle, go ahead and use some vermiculite too, you absolutely can. It's just uh, vermiculite costs a bit more money, that's all, but uh, you can add a little bit of more aeration in there. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's the first one that I highly recommend if you're a beginner. The next mix that I'm going to use is going to resemble the uh, forest floor. Um, so it's going to be very airy, it's going to have a lot of organic material and a lot of the plants like your calatheas and begonias are going to like this uh, soil medium because it drains uh, really really quickly. And then I'm going to add a little bit more. Oh, this is the bamboo, uh, dried bamboo and uh, twigs, sorry I forgot to mention. And I'm going to add a little bit of the uh, burnt rice hulls again. This is again to prevent uh, root rot. Not prevent, sorry, it it cuts down the incidence of root rot. So yeah, there you have it. Now you have something that is very uh, similar to a forest floor where you have uh, charred burnt material because forest actually is covered in organic material and also charred material as you know a lot of the things do burn up once in a while. Uh, and if I wanted to add extra aeration, I can also go ahead and add some more perlite in here. So as you can see, this is super airy. It does take a little bit of moisture. It keeps um, it keeps the plant uh, damp, but not soggy moist. It's never sitting in water. Uh, but you do need to water this pretty frequently. I would even go as far as say every day if you live in the outdoors. 
and this allows air to be circulating in the in the soil the next setup is actually the most requested and that's my aeroid mix so with aeroid i'm gonna go i have two that i use one is um with coconut husk so this allows water to drain through really fast it, re it really it's like it's good for epiphytes because it resembles like chunks of wood where these plants actually grow in in nature um, i either use this or i can also use um this is fine pine bark. I usually use this for my more expensive plants, like the, my variegated monsteras, my philodendron tortoise. They, I feel like, in my mind, I feel like they enjoy this a little bit more than the uh, than this coconut husk. But uh, they're into, oh my god, someone's calling me. Uh, yeah, ignore that phone call. So um, yeah, I, I'm in this video. I'm gonna add both because why not? You could choose either one depending on where what you can get in your area. Uh, and then next, I would even go as far as add some more perlite so it's a very very airy mix and uh, some burnt rice hulls and in here i would add a little bit of worm casting let's give this a good mix oh and of, of course and uh, by the way this is also very good for your hoyas the, the, this mix and i can also add a little bit of vermiculite so this is again it's very similar to perlite it's gonna give you a little bit of aeration in there um, And at this point, like you have a very chunky airy mix that really dries up within, I would say, a few hours. If you you say you think to yourself like, oh, I can't possibly water my plants every so often, you can go ahead and add. In my case, I'm gonna go ahead and add some uh, cocoa peat in here. So this will absorb a lot of the moisture and and hold on to them a bit longer. So you still have your airy, uh, chunky uh, mix in there, but you also you don't have to water as often so yeah let me quickly show, i'm actually going to add a little bit more of the of this sorry so yeah so that is my aeroid mix for you guys and again another thing that you want to consider be mindful of is whether you want to use plastic pots or uh, terracotta terracotta will dry up two to three times faster than a uh, plastic pot would so i have three uh, rooted peperomia vessels here and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pot them up using different soil medium because i know that in my experience all all of these soil medium will allow the plant to thrive but I'm just going to have to adjust my watering frequency based on the medium that I have used or chosen rather. Yeah, I'm going to pot up these uh, cuttings uh, for you live <laughs> and uh, into the, the different mixes that I have done. So the first one, I'm, I'm going to choose terracotta pot and I'm going to use this, uh, this, <laughs> this soil that is a little bit slow to drain. So this will allow it to, the terracotta will allow it to dry out a bit faster because if you know anything about uh, Peperomia hope is that they want to dry out a bit fast. They don't want to be uh, sitting in water and they can be, they're very prone to overwatering. So, just a disclaimer I may not be able to pop this as nicely as I would uh, because I have, uh, I have performance anxiety. Um, but this will do, oops, okay. Ta da! And in the beginning, I'm gonna have to keep this uh, very moist and never let this dry out because the, the cutting is used to living in uh, in a very wet situation, in, a, in water, so you know, in a, in a very moist uh, environment, so I cannot let it dry out. But in the future, as it becomes mature, uh, I will have to let it dry out between watering. And again, with pepper, I may hope you wanna squeeze the leaves. Like right now, you can't really even squeeze it because it's so hard. Um, but when it's thirsty, it will be soft and limp, and that's when you know to water them. So here's one. Actually, that was pretty fast. Yeah, and I've made so many of these uh, successful cuttings before that I know that this will do well. This will completely uh, take root. So the next one I will grow in a plastic pot. Like this here. And this I will give it the aeroid mix.
For this, I will have to water very often. I would even go as far as say every day. So that's so much work. I might end up giving this to someone <laughs> because I do want my my plants to be less fussy. And I've got so many. I've got like I don't know how many peperomia hope I have in my care right now. Too much. Too many. They are slow growers, but they are very reliable. Like they. It's not easy to kill them and they don't need a lot of light, they don't need a lot of attention and if you underwater it, they will forgive you, they're not going to um, give you any troubles and they're also relatively uh, pest free, they're not going to invite any pests to your collection. So, um, kind of pack it in nice and then you see some uh, space here, you just give them, tug it in a little bit. Okay, I'm talking to myself at this point. <laughs> I just broke off a new growth point. Sorry. Oh, but it'll grow back. So they will grow from the um, so they they will grow from the nodes here. Like new stems will come out from there. So sorry, little guy. Yeah, and that's one. And the last one, I'm gonna give it that uh, understory. Oh my god, where's my other pot? Okay. So this I will also have to water pretty frequently. I've seen a lot of uh, peperomias grown in this medium uh, out in the nurseries and they, I'm sure they do appreciate that too because the, this one dries out really fast. So guys you can actually grow your plants in many different um, soil types um, depending on your conditions although um, some plants do prefer uh, a, a certain qualities in the soil. For example, like I mentioned, aeroids do like something chunkier that they can grow roots that really grip onto the media. And peperomia, I noticed, they do like to be, they do like to dry out very fast. So you, they will survive in, in uh, pots and media that is like, that retains moisture a bit longer and you just kind of cut down on watering. But they will really thrive for you when you give them in a airy uh, a soil that and you water them frequently. They would really appreciate that more. Yep, and I am done. So again, um, I'm gonna go back to this. This is the, the soil that is most commonly used, that I use because I, it holds on to moisture longer and I don't have to water it as much. It's also something that I think a lot of nurseries or growers would use because this soil is versatile. Any plant, whether you're an aeroid or an epiphyte, can live, whether you're a fern, you can live in here. Uh, so I highly recommend this formula for a beginner. Here is my LECA setup and uh, just a preview for you guys. I'll do a video for you to give you the details but here is a, a cutting that's lived here for about a month and it's doing well. It hasn't given me brown edges and it's got a new growth point. So I rooted him in water first and then I stuck it into uh, these like a balls and uh, in there I put a little bit of water <laughs> I can see. So I'll just leave, the, leave this plant in here. Uh, it's, it's actually better for you to have a clear vessel so you can see the water level because this is a little bit scary like I never know if this plant is drying out or not. Ooh, this, the roots are coming out. I need to plant this back inside soon. Hopefully I don't forget after the video. So yeah, that's, that's my LECA uh, setup. So here's a bit of bonus material for you guys. I was a little stressed out by that philodendron tordum that's growing in LECA because I didn't have a clear vessel for it to, to check down the soil. And I decided it's just so much easier for me to put it in my aeroid mix, which I already have anyways. So I'm gonna go ahead and pot it up in the aeroid mix. I'm gonna add a bit of bark too because this plant is a little bit extra. Oops, I just knocked over a propagation vessel. So yeah, I want to give this plant a little bit of extra loving, so give it a bit more chunkier mix. I bought this tordum when it was not expensive yet. And now the prices have skyrocketed and it's a good thing that I've propagated him into three separate cuttings. So as you can see here, that's the, that's the growth point that's happening here. So I don't want to bear, oh, there are two growth points. This is freaking amazing. It's going to have two stems coming out of this probably. So I don't want to bury that too deep uh, into the soil. And if uh, experience has taught me is that philodendrons, uh, they can, um, they acclimatize really well to being potted up from lack of from water. They, they will adapt 
very quickly. So yeah, I don't want to bury that too deep. Um, this is totally just falling over. It's not cooperating with me. I may have to like support it like down here with like something so it doesn't uh, fall off the pot. So yeah, that's my Tordum uh, in my new Aeroid mix for you. Okay, so I hope that was uh, useful <laughs> and I didn't confuse you even more. But uh, and next I'm going to talk to you about some of the mistakes I've made. I'm going to walk you around the house and show you some of the soil mediums that I used that I'm going to repot soon. <laughs> I don't know if I have time soon. I have, I have a few meetings like for the next few days to come. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'll work on those soon, but they are not doing so well in their current soil medium. So I'll, I'll, I, and I'll tell you why. Here we have an Imidrium medium silver and it's keeping, keep giving me uh, dry tips. Uh, and some over here. And I cut these off because they were so dry. Uh, and this plant has been with me for a while, but I water him every day now and it just keeps giving me brown tips which means that i need to change its uh, pot and soil medium it needs more moisture in there that's alocasia silver dragon i can't neglect him he's in a terracotta pot and he's very pot brown and uh, i think he's drying out too fast because the tips are, are crisping up and this one is just very very crispy and uh, yeah i need to put him in a bigger pot and maybe a plastic pot too so that it can uh, retain moisture a little bit longer. All right, so here is an Anthurium clarinervium that I got about three weeks ago, and I potted, I repotted him uh, into this very very airy uh, aeroid mix and in terracotta pot, which means that it's dried almost um, instantly, like very quickly. And I water him every day. However, I don't think it's happy here because it's showing signs of uh, uh, dry tips in that one too. So I'm going to have to repot him into something that would be that would retain a lot more moisture. Or I can do what I do with my next anthurium over here, next pot over. I can cover the topsoil with uh, sphagnum moss. So the sphagnum moss will actually retain a lot of the moisture and seal that uh, moisture deep in the soil a lot longer. And this guy has been putting out so much roots and growth since I, I added this uh, sphagnum moss here. So I may actually do that with here just to add a, a, a top layer of sphagnum moss. Here is a very happy Philodendron Gloriosum as a propagate and I put it in a terracotta pot and a very well draining uh, aeroid mix. This means that I can water him every day without even checking uh, to see if the soil is dry or not because I know that within a few hours the soil will be dry completely. So in their natural habitat they actually live in very humid um, tropical rainforest that rains very very frequently or mists very very often but then they would also be allowed to dry out almost completely very quickly so they are happy with this condition and as you can see this is growing like gangbusters all right so the last thing i need to cover is the nutrient factor uh, of your soil and in my hand here we have a caladium and this is another one that came back from dormancy and i think this is a flower i don't know what this looks it's oh it's heavy <laughs> it's funky it's kind of gross uh yeah um, but uh, he's, he's coming back with so much vigor. I'm really happy for him and he's bigger. It, this leaf is like as big as my face, I think. <laughs> so anyway, wait, what was I going to talk about? Hang on. Uh, oh yeah, nutrient and fertilizing. So uh, for a nutrient fertilizer, I actually use um, three types. I'm going to cover uh, fertilizing in a separate video in detail, but just generally in soil. Because soil do, does need some kind of organic material to help the, the plant uh, give it the extra boost. So I do use um, Decastar, which is like a slow release fertilizer. And then I use a Grow More brand, which is a chemical fertilizer. This I mix in with my water and I water it whenever I remember. Um, and then I also use worm casting. So that's a natural fertilizer. It's actually worm poop. So again, I'll go through the fertilizing um, video with you. But in case you guys feel like you need to fertilize your plant, plants now, remember to just do it lightly and, and not over fertilize your plants. But they do require that nutrient in the soil. So as you can see, soil science can be a little bit confusing. But give just give it a try and just buy a few bags of different uh, mediums and, and mix it yourself. You'll know it when you put your hand in the pot in, in the soil, you will know that um, you know, you will know how the root feels and you will have an understanding of um, how to control the moisture in your pot because that will help your plants thrive. And again, um, what we covered before with sunlight, 
water and now soil these three components are actually the most important they are like a triangle I may do a video to recap I promise you guys so many videos uh, I'm gonna do a video to recap this triangle and how you can actually adjust the variables from each of these um, to suit to your um, needs like for example if you are you cannot water your plants very often you can give them uh, sort of a, a potting soil that is retaining moisture a lot longer you can put it in a less bright spot and you can put it in a plastic pot so all these factors will allow the plant to be happy there without having you want to water it every single day all right so i guess this is all the time i have for you today if you haven't seen my sunlight and water video do check those out uh, i find that they're very useful and relatable to what we are discussing here today and um, thank you so much for subscribing to my channel this channel has exploded and it's, uh, I'm now actually adjusting some of my business uh, responsibilities so I can spend a little bit more time on this channel. And it's my passion and it's my joy to bring you these contents. So um, for those of you who haven't su subscribed yet, please do that and uh, leave a comment down below. Uh, send me likes. And I'm at Botanist on Instagram. So do DM me there if you have any questions. I'll try to get to you. Uh, meanwhile, take care and stay safe, everybody. <laughs> and bye.